goddamn flashbacks. Guess again, sunshine. There was a time back in the PlayStation 2 and original Xbox era when a lot of sequels were what kids today would call just a bunch of DLC stuck together. And that's basically what we've got with Destroy All Humans 2 Reprobed. A loyal, graphically updated remake of a 2006 sequel that goes to new locations, adds a handful of new weapons and enemy types, revamps the upgrade system, and extends the story. But even after that, it plays so much like 2020's Destroy All Humans Reprobed that it feels like a clone, except its comedy act has already worn a bit thin. Bearing that in mind, I have pretty much the same praise and the same complaints about the quality of this remake. The gameplay has held up fairly well in that it's always going to be pretty satisfying to bounce around with a jetpack, blasting people with a Palpatine-like lightning gun, and popping their heads to collect the brains inside. Cartoony character models and 4K textures look respectable when making out details like Crypto's pointy little teeth. The dynamic lighting effects are a nice touch. It's the animations and lip syncing that seem behind the times. You sure you heard right? These stiff movements and strange gesticulations remind me of a world before motion capture animation became the norm. Everyone looks like an action figure. Also, it's noticeable that there aren't many unique faces among NPCs, especially when you've possessed a human body. There are a few other hints that this is an old game that's been upgraded. For one, there's not a single cryptocurrency joke in a comedy game released in 2022 where the main character's name is literally Crypto. But even more telling than that, when you arrive on the Japan map, you'll hear some prolific voice actors like Yuri Lowenthal and Steve Bloom playing some Japanese caricatures they would probably wince at today. So the code is in my briefcase which was stolen by Brack Ninja and taken back to their base. Oh, so that's what this warning at startup was talking about. Skipping ahead 10 years after the first game to 1969, Crypto's new enemies are buffoonish Soviet KGB agents who have discovered the Furon presence on Earth. Joining him are his old boss Pox, who I can't not love thanks to his being voiced by Invader Zim's hilariously shouty Richard Horvitz. And then there's hypersexualized KGB defector Natalia, who is there largely to inspire a constant barrage of sleazy jokes from crypto. Absolutely nothing is taken seriously, but that doesn't stop Destroy All Humans 2 from spending a lot longer on dialogue than its humor justifies. Listening to an alien imitating Jack Nicholson riff at length on hippies' fashion sense, call a Soviet Ivan for the umpteenth time, or rattle off pickup lines wasn't exactly cutting-edge comedy back in 2006, much less today. Mm, you still think I'm sexy, right? Mercifully, you can skip most of it easily once you get tired of it. You realize the player's in the kitchen making nachos at this point, right? By modern open-world standards, Destroy All Humans' five modestly-sized maps are bare bones in terms of interactivity and things you can do beyond destroying simple-minded humans. They don't even have the abduction and rampage challenge missions the first game does. Local color comes from scanning the thoughts of pedestrians, which contains some of the best jokes you'll find. I do give it credit for letting us blow up nearly any building on maps based on San Francisco, London, Tokyo, Tunguska, and a secret base, and they're all largely bright and colorful playgrounds to blast enemies in. That fighting could be a bit more engaging, though. I started out on the second highest difficulty and found myself feeling nearly invincible out of the gate. After remembering that I could simply fly away whenever I was in danger, I almost never died until about halfway through when tougher enemies show up, and even then, it was rare outside of boss fights. There are some mutators you can enable to make everything harder, or easier, or just give people big heads, but not until you've already beaten the mission for the first time and want to replay it. The main reason it's usually so easy is that the vast majority of fights are against human enemies, and even in large numbers they simply don't stand a chance. And that's before you start upgrading your arsenal to more efficiently eradicate them. Even without a gun, you can launch them into low earth orbit with your brain as quickly as you could zap them with a ray gun. Though nearly every encounter is trivial and the consequences of being spotted by the police are basically irrelevant. Admittedly, that is in keeping with the theme of being a technologically advanced alien invader, but the power fantasy appeal of these slaughters wears off a lot quicker after having done this for a full game already. Combat never actually gets all that interesting, but it becomes a little more demanding when you start to encounter enemies who are shielded or vulnerable to a specific weapon, though you have to switch between them instead of picking a gun you like and pulling the trigger till it goes click. The new weapons don't actually do much to change things up, the dislocator disc amusingly bounces targets around randomly but isn't terribly efficient at killing them, and the others mostly amount to new area of effect attacks. By far my most used was Gastro, a summonable flying sidekick who shoots enemies for you. He's handy when the going gets tough. What saves missions from being almost entirely made up of scanning brains leading you to a simple firefight are the secondary objectives that pop up. Maybe you're prompted to use a specific weapon to kill some specific enemies, or avoid touching the ground while traveling across the city. 
A lot of these are mundane, but every so often there was something that changed up a straightforward objective and made me work a little bit to get a perfect score on the mission and get the maximum upgrade points. Also mostly unchanged from the first game is the flying saucer gameplay, which is still not great. Aside from blowing things up in a straightforward shooting gallery, most of the other tasks it's used for are moving large objects from place to place or an inconvenient form of fast travel between unlocked landing zones. Also, every time you come to a new area, you're encouraged to unlock upgrades by flying around and hoovering up dozens of humans of various stripes, such as police or ninjas or KGB agents. Given how simple it is to deflect incoming missiles or obliterate targets on the ground, the only challenge here is searching the map for the specific kinds of humans you need. Once you find them, this becomes almost as dull as actual vacuuming. You could likely burn through the main missions fairly quickly, but I did every side mission I could find, which was quite a lot. Many of them revolve around converting people to your alien god-worshipping cult, and those generally have you impersonating humans to get a mission, usually killing other humans, after listening to an excessively long introduction that repeats the name Arkvoodle way too many times. Arkvoodle. Arkvoodle! Arkvoodle. 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 So tell us. What does Ark Voodle listen to? These missions are certainly useful for feeding the expanded upgrading system. Each weapon now has six upgrades instead of three, but it was a little anticlimactic to find that all of this missionary work amounted to a new weapon unlock that didn't tie into the main story. Behold! Oh, Lastly, it's kind of a shame that Destroy All Humans 2 doesn't support online co-op, but Split Screen is suitably retro and lets you and a friend double down on destruction. There's no friendly fire and you can't pick each other up, which limits opportunities for goofing on each other, but there are a few games out there that aren't improved by running around with a friend. There's also a duel mode in which you compete to see who can break the most stuff the fastest, which is fun but very much like what you do when you're just playing co-op in the campaign. And there's a PK tennis game that is sort of like real tennis but harder to control. I don't see that last one taking off, to be honest. Destroy All Humans 2 Reprobe does a fine job of updating the 2006 original to look like a modern game, but that game was a fairly unambitious sequel that didn't do much to evolve its gameplay. And while I'd be fine with a somewhat repetitive campaign that breaks up its missions with comedy, this is some solid c material that only occasionally lands a chuckle, and more often some serious cringes. In its favor, split-screen co-op does make it more enjoyable to blast through, and combat does eventually get tougher when bulkier enemies join the fray. But by and large, it's more of the same B-movie sci-fi homage without a lot of brain-popping new ideas. For more on breaking stuff, check out our reviews of Saints Row and Gigabash. And for everything else, stick with IGN. I am Cryptosporidium of the planet Furon. This planet is now a territory of the Furon Empire. And your asses belong to me.